weeks ago, so he gave me a lot of time to prepare. And uh, I don't know whether you way early or way long. I'm not even sure. But uh, I hope that the message this morning will, uh, will be good for us and, and something we can all appreciate and take home with us. Uh, we'll be learning this morning out of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through 4.16. We're not going to read all that. We're just going to cover all that. So uh, we'll be out of here before 3 o'clock, I'm sure. <laughs> <coughs> so let's uh, let's pray before we get started. Father, thank you, thank you for this uh, gathering this morning. We came here eagerly to hear your word. Uh, Father, let me speak it just like you wanted her. We thank you for the work of your Son on Calvary, uh, who came for us and who saved us all. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, so I'll start by just reading from uh, from Scripture. Uh, and if you notice me looking down, i got a lot of pages of notes, and I'll try and look up as much as I can. I'm not very practiced at public speaking, but just to read it, I'll run. So we'll start in verse 1, and we'll read through verse uh, 17 of, the new, of my version here. I have the New American Standard Bible. Uh, Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. So, Paul introduces something that he learned a while ago. I forgot my Bible. It's a good thing I wrote it. I just transferred it over. Thank you, God. You're helping me out already. Wow. Something I noticed right out, of the, right out of the gate in this first part of, in this first part of Scripture is the frequency with which Paul mentions or calls out God or Jesus Christ or our Lord 19 times, 19 times in the first 10 verses. Specifically, he calls out our Lord Jesus Christ seven times, if I include the pronoun, personal pronoun, or his title. So he calls seven times. That catches my eye. 
catches, that catches my attention. I'm not sure where it's going to go, but it catches my attention. Um, it's not unique in, in Paul's writing that he mentions uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. In, in almost in all of them, except for one, he mentions the Lord Jesus Christ at least once or twice in his greeting. In Titus, he doesn't mention it at all. That's the unique one. In his greeting, he doesn't mention the Lord Jesus Christ. But in he does cite it seven times in the greeting and opening of uh, 2 Thessalonians. And we might find that there's something a little bit similar about what's happening in 2 Thessalonians and about what's happening in uh, the church in Corinth. I'm not saying there's anything um, significant about the number seven in this case, so don't get me wrong. Um, the number, don't, we're not going to go down that road. The number seven does mean um, spiritual perfection in Christian numerology. It's associated with that, but like I said, we're not going there. Uh, that's beyond my pay grade. Somebody else can explain all that to you. Um, but there may be something in common with uh, Second Thessalonians. So, in if you've studied or, or read Second Thessalonians, you'll remember. That, or you may remember, I don't know. You remember that it's a church under pressure or under persecution. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Thanks, Mark. Luke, John, Acts.
stab him if you declared your faith. The Roman centurions had a, the authority to just run their spirit. Right? But that's not what Paul is talking about here. Persecution in this context uh, literally means, or the Greek word is diagomon. Right? And if I had a slideshow, which I don't have, I could show you what the Greek word is, what the Greek text is, but I don't have it, so you're just going to take my word for it. I hope you do. I hope earn your trust so that you do take my word for it. Um, literally means to systematically organize a program to oppress and harass people. So it's not necessarily the physical violence, right? But it's a systematic harassment of people. The way they did Paul, the way they wanted to bring him before the court, and they chased him around. They did the same thing to the people of the church in Thessalonica. Likely, this pattern for them never changed. It sort of ebbed and flowed throughout Paul's experience and throughout his missionary journeys. Uh, we read in a couple places in Acts where he would show up on his missionary journeys and the Jews would come down and chase him out. Well, when they say the Jews would come down and chase him, this is where they were coming from. So this came, this happened all the time to Paul. But it was this uh, uh, pressure from the community of Thessalonica that was a problem for the church. They did not want the gospel preached there. They, they did not want the good news of Jesus Christ communicated to them. It was, up, it, it was opposed to what they believed in uh, Judaism. Uh, so in, in Corinth, the pressure is not from Jews, per se. Um, the church there is mainly made up of Gentiles. And it's not necessarily conscious or organized opposition, so it's not called persecution there. Um, but it could be something far more insidious. It could be something far more difficult to fight, and, and I believe it's still a challenge for our church today. Not just here, but for the church of God today. And notice that he calls it the church of God, Paul does, in, that, uh, in, in the opening. He calls it the church of God, all of us. Okay, so before, now, we're done with Thessalonia. <laughs> Let's go back to Corinth. So there's some similarity there, and I think we'll be able to reach back and see what, what that is. Uh, so to, to really understand what's happening in a, a church or to a, to a community, we need to know a little bit about uh, the community, the surrounding community, and what, that, what they look like. The history of Corinth, um, it existed for I don't know, several hundred years before Rome came through and destroyed Corinth. Um, and it, it stayed down for a while, but it was refounded as a Roman city. Uh, it, it regained its footing, and then Rome came back to it and said, well, this place is great, we're going to take it. So they did, around 44 B.C. Um, after that time, it very quickly rose to, to prominence uh, economically, um, uh, strategically, primarily because of its uh, location. Um, so Corinth... If you're, I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the geography of the Middle of the Mediterranean, but uh, let's see, the, my best hand. So Italy's way up here. If you need directions to the grocery store, ask Trish, because I'll get you <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> Italy's way over here. Greece is across the sea and down this direction, and there's a very narrow isthmus that connects Greece to the Peloponnesus area, where the, the Peloponnesian Wars were and all that stuff. There's, so there's this very short, very narrow, uh, approximately six mile wide isthmus. It's kind of like a dog bone. You have a really, you know, this cartoon dog bone, like this, and short in the middle. Well, big dog bones on the end and really short in the center and very narrow. So the distance between these two bodies of water was about six miles. Mariners who navigated around the, uh, uh, the Mediterranean did not uh, enjoy having to go down around the Peloponnesian Islands. Um, there's a lot of stories and myths about monsters and things that would come up and grab them just because the seas there are so violent. 
Uh, they don't want to go that way. Turns out it was a lot easier and a lot more predictable for them to, to sail into Corinth and to literally take the boat out of the water and drag it across land, across this isthmus, to, um, to the other side of Corinthian, the sea of, uh, into the Asian Sea, and sail across there back into the Mediterranean and go to finish their journey. There's actually a, a, a paved road there uh, that still exists where they did this. They, they put a lot of effort into making this paved road, and as far back as, um, where is that? Uh, as far back as 602 BC, there's a leader named Periander that, that thought it would be a good idea to dig a canal there instead of dragging the boats across. We had a boat once, and I, it was nothing like these seagoing vessels. No, we're not talking about the giant Mayflower type things that they sailed across the Atlantic Ocean on, right? I'm sure they were a lot smaller than that. But even our little 18 foot boat, fiberglass boat, I can't imagine dragging that six inches. So that was no easy task, but something they would rather do, right? And that, that because of that location, and they would rather, they, they would like to do that rather than go around the ocean, Corinth became uh, uh, prosperous just because of the traffic that came through there. Um, they were heavily influenced by Greece, uh, who at the time we know was uh, had many idols, uh, and they were religiously pluralistic. Uh, by that I mean in a summary, every religion of them was valid. Whatever you believed, whatever, whatever your system of belief was, it was as good as any other. The people in Corinth thought the same way. They were just fascinated with different religions and different beliefs. Uh, so, just as an aside, in 1923, finally, they built the canal. It took a long time to it was better than dragging the boats. <laughs> so, and I think it probably became better at, at not sinking when they went around the Peloponnesians. But uh, from a Jewish Christian or Jewish or Christian point of view, this kind of city with this religious pluralism and their idols. Uh, during remember back in Acts when Paul goes to Greece, Paul goes to Athens. If you recall there, he became um, disturbed by the number of idols that he saw. His soul became agitated. agitated. Um, at the time that Paul was there, 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 Athens is thought to have as many as 30,000 different gods. So it was easier, they say, it was easier to find a god or, or, a, or a shrine to something than a human person. It, it was much easier to just find one of those. So, we would think of that city as uh, marked by their worship of idols, um, their sexual immorality, and their greed. Uh, still common things today, right? Not much different, but it's a very cosmopolitan city. They're, they're just kind of numb and used to this whole way of doing things there in Corinth. That's how they did it. That they, the, the kind of people that would drag boats across the, uh, the rocks were, I don't know, maybe not very, certainly could find something better to do. So uh, if you were very smart, you could do something else. So the, the people that would come through there were uh, a little different. But Paul, in his, uh, in his opening, to Corinthians, calls them the church of God, right? Because the church belongs to God. The church that Paul established there belongs to God. It was established there during Paul's second missionary journey where he spent 18 months. We learn that in Acts 18. We won't go there, but you can go there and read that if you haven't read Acts. You'll, you'll know, you'll learn that he established a church there, and and uh, in a vision, he was told to go ahead and stay there for a long time. He 
he spent a lot of time and a lot of a lot put in a lot of effort to establish the church there, and he did leave a strong church. In the greeting, we learn that he personally baptized Crispus, Gaius, and the whole household of Stephanus. So the church there, while Paul was there, would have been a strong church. He personally put it together. We know of Paul's work, and we know that he we know of, of uh, in, through his writing of uh, the great missionary that he was, and, the, and that his letters live on today as examples of what the church should be. But a lot happened between when Paul left and Paul's writing of this letter. But Paul also maybe Peter traveled to Corinth and, and uh, helped to build the church there. We're not sure about Peter, but if you were in that area of, of travel, it would have been hard not to go through Corinth to get anywhere. Kind of like trying to get to Atlanta without going through DFW right now. Just everything goes through there. Now, Paul has also written a letter prior to this one to the Corinthians, responding to questions that they wrote to him. He mentions it in uh, chapter 5, verses 9 and 11. And in this letter, he warns believers not to associate with people who are sexually immoral or greedy or who are involved in idolatry. Let's go there and read that. You know, that's what we should do. Let's go to uh, chapter 5, verse 9.
giant sea monsters and such, and they wanted to hear them. And in that culture, um, the rich would feed speakers and, and fund speakers so that the community itself uh, faceted off into small groups. It's just the way they did things. You believed in this guy speaking, or this guy speaking, or this guy speaking, and it's, it was just natural for them. But Paul, in his letter, let's run back to, run back to the beginning, Paul reminds them of who they are in Jesus Christ. This is, Paul is having to attack this first. Paul chose this part to attack first on purpose. There's a lot of things that Corinthians talks about. It talks about flee sexual immorality, flee idolatry. But Paul chose this first because everything that happens to them later comes from this inability to separate themselves from their community, from their religious pluralism, from their, uh, uh, their, their desire, their just innate. Make them feel, feel good to just debate with somebody and be in a clique. Paul knows he has to fix that. So he reminds them seven times of who they are in G Lord Jesus Christ. That they, um, so we'll read four through seven over again now. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in this passage, Paul reminds them that they've already received everything they, they, they they've already received so much in Christ Jesus. It's not a waiting till the end. That's one thing that separates. Uh, if you've been with us in a Romans class, we know that's one thing that separates uh, Judaism from Christianity. Was Judaism would would work and work and work to see if they were saved at the end. Christianity says you're saved now, and you receive the blessings of Jesus Christ right now. You receive blessings and the goodness from God right now. He's reminding of that, that they're, he's reminding the community of that, that they're enriched in all speech and all knowledge. Confirmed here is kind of a tough one. I think probably in some of your Bibles it doesn't say confirmed, it says strengthened or something like that. Um, encouraged, um, I'm not sure what some of the Bible translations say. Um, the, the Greek manuscript says... God has caused you to know for certain who Jesus Christ is. That's the word. It's hard to put in one word. That's why we have all these different. That's why we have all these different translations. The word that they used meant that whole sentence. So, the, to, to to use a word is hard to find one. That's why we have these different things in different Bibles. So, confirmed means God. God has has already told you. Everything you need to know, and he's confirmed it in you through Christ Jesus. It's all past tense. You're not waiting to receive something later. You have it now. You have God's blessings now through his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The next time he uses confirmed, which most Bibles uses the same word, it means something a little different. In this case, where, he, where, where Paul says, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, the meaning is somewhat evident in the, in the way it's used, right? That Jesus Christ is the, one, is the one who will cause you to trust or rely on him until the end. Jesus Christ is the one who's going to bring this to you. So to confirm you, it's the, the word there is, is more self-evident in the way it's used. But... All of these things are meant to be encouraging to the Corinthians. And the beginning of this reorientation to away from, away from the, the outside, away from the community. Paul begins his exhortation in verse 10. So 
he says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. The meat of this passage lies in the understanding of this verse, not in the divisions where Paul talks about you're divided in, some of you say Paul, some of you say I'm of Cephas, some of you say I'm of Apollos. The meat is here in this verse 10. Um, so that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete. Paul uses this phrase in two other places. Or Paul uses it in one other place. Jesus uses it in another. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Adequate is complete. He uses that word in that phraseology, that you be prepared, that you be made complete, that through your work in Jesus Christ, not the community, that you be made complete. Jesus uses it in uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 40, where he says, A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. So Paul, when he says... I am of Paul, I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. There's actually not four factions here. There's only three. There are three factions. There's a set of people who believe who are under Apollos. There's a set of people who, are, who, who, who in the same way that they did with the community, align under Paul. Not because he preaches the gospel but because they see him like any of the other philosophers they saw. The same way with Cephas. The same way with Apollos. They just saw them as another good person. And maybe inside the church, there were people of, 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 of high influence and of high authority that fed that the same way they did outside the church. When Paul says, I of Christ, He's saying that he's with Christ. It's not another faction. It says, he's saying, if you're with me, you're with Christ. That's the same way that the phrase from Jesus fits. Paul is referring there that if you're like the teacher, a pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. Paul is saying, if you're with me, you're with Christ. The other part of this phrase is judgment. That you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul uses that in another place. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the same phrase. He says, but in my opinion, she is happier if she remains as she is. The part where it's common here is where he says, and I think I also have the spirit of God. In their judgment, the way Corinthian people thought, they would go to someone else, they would go to their favorite speaker and ask, what do you think of this? this? This sounds like good stuff. Paul is saying, Paul is teaching them in chapter 7. We're not going to go there today. Way too far. Um, Paul is teaching them that he goes to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is his second opinion. Not, not one of your philosophers. So with this understanding of chapter 10, I hope we can see uh, with these fragments that Paul is asking them, he's commanding them to stop aligning yourself with the philosophers, people that you think are philosophers. Your method of thinking is incorrect. The gospel, the gospel is what you need to let change your life, not the philosophers. Do become, do become prepared, each one of you, through
through study of Scripture, through allowing the gospel to work in you, allowing it to change your life, become prepared to come together communally. So prepare individually, continually prepare yourself to come together communally under the Lord Jesus Christ. Which he mentioned seven times. Right? Seven times. Trying to get them out of the rut and into the Lord Jesus Christ, who you serve. So, for I have been informed, I'm going to read, I'll finish reading this now, and I'll start over. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed. That means he's been, it's been made clear to him. There's no questions. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are cores among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. It takes Paul through, from, right, from the next verse, all the way through verse 17 of chapter 4 to unwind this thought. We're not going to read every verse. We're not going to do that. You're welcome. Yeah. Oh. But it takes Paul the rest of this section to unwind what he's trying to tell them. It's the most important thing he needs to tell them. That you're not stepping away from the world around you. You are. Um, we learned uh, of the of the mustard, the parable of the mustard seed at, at uh, couples retreat, right? And how the mustard seed, the 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 the, uh, the uh, Pharisees had these beautifully manicured um, herb gardens, and and Jesus is telling them. The, the gospel is like a mustard seed planted in your garden where beautiful trees, uh, this beautiful tree will grow and birds will come and sing. And, and that's a pretty thought, right? That's a wonderful thought. Beautiful. But they didn't want a mustard seed in their garden. Mustard seed's a weed. They don't know anything about prepared mustard. They know that it's a weed. They want their garden like their garden. Corinthians want their church like their life. They're not letting the, the gospel come in and disrupt what their plans are, what, their, what they think should happen. They are still Hellenists. So Paul summarizes, because Paul, Paul could, no, no, I'm not going to say it. Paul summarizes at the end of uh, chapter 4, in verse 16 of chapter 4, he says, therefore I exhort you to be imitators of me. He's telling them, I'm like Christ. I showed you. I came to the church. I, I was there. Be imitators of me in these ways. Paul expects the Corinthians to imitate these things that he finds in this passage, these things that he tells them, to be like Christ, to, that, that will help them separate from their, their life outside the church. For Paul, it's specifically aimed at things that will, that will fix this problem of boasting and factionalism, which is happening to them. That's happening because they're not separated from the church. They're not separated from the community. For us, I think these four things will help us become more Christ-like, period. These four things are, um, let's read, so now we're going to do something unusual. We're not going to read it in sequence. We're going to just kind of bounce around and read how Paul put these arguments together. So in verses 3.10 and 4.7, <coughs> Paul says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. That's 310. 
in 4 7, Paul says, For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? In those two verses, Paul is telling them there to recognize that all they have comes to them as a grace gift of God. That they're not inherently extraordinary. As opposed to what they think, that there are great speakers, and let's go listen to that. There's nothing extraordinary about that person. Whatever he has, God gave them. To you individually, whatever you have, whatever I have. I'm not an extraordinary speaker. I'm just telling you what Scripture said. Whatever I have, God gave to me. We can go back to 3 5. In chapter 3, verse 5, Paul writes, What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. And in 4.1, he says, Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And in 4.5, he says, Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness, and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. In these verses, Paul is telling them they are to think of themselves as no better than menial field hands. They are servants. It's the idea of servants. Menial field hands and servants awaiting God's judgment. Nothing more. You have been given the grace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you serve. You are servants. Don't go out seeking extraordinary things. Wonders must. I love the wonder. But so in three, five through nine, go back there again. We'll finish reading through what we already started. What, what then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted Apollos water, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. God's building. In this small passage, they are he's telling them to rid themselves of all resentments and all rivalries and with their co-workers there in Corinth so that they can toil together in God's field. And back in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Remember, this is all correction to get them out of the rut they are. To get them away from their connection to the community. and The way they thought. The gospel has got to renew your mind. Transform your mind. Paul says, and when I came to you, brethren, I did not come to you with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Pastor Ray has told us that if you research that word weakness, it means he was sick. He was he had an infection from the times he was beat. He was trembling and bandaged and weak, sick. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and of power. That's the only way he could have gotten up there to speak in his condition, 
the lashings that he took, and the infection that he suffered. But it's only the Holy Spirit that could enable him to even speak to them. So he's telling them to resist passing yourselves off as wise or elite by using lofty words or wisdom or being something extraordinary. Or, and to stop aligning yourselves with those who do and to rely instead on the power of God that works through weakness, fear, and trembling. He has shown us mighty works, but he has also chosen the foolish. He chose the foolish to shame the wise. So, this is all really unusual for us. That Paul would tell them to, to, to imitate me. But to them it made perfect sense. To them, when he said be like me, that's what they were used to doing in, with their philosophers. They, they would try and be like this other guy. Well, Paul is saying be like me because I'm like Christ. Remember three factions, not four. I'm like Christ, so be like me. Paul did everything he could to be like Christ. We should be doing everything we can to be like Christ. Don't follow me because I'm wise or because I speak well or because I do some, have some skill. Follow me because I'm like Christ. Paul's drawing them into the church. He's using what they are already to draw them into the church. He recognizes that this is just a natural tendency for them. So be like me. Because of Paul's first experience, Paul recognizes this because he's a, he's a uh, superior root cause analyzer, right? That's a, problem. That's, a, that's a popular thing now, right? Everybody wants to know what the root cause is of a problem. Paul knew the root cause. Paul knew that the problem, the reason he misinterpreted the letter the first time was because the gospel the gospel was not having the effect it should. They were resisting it. They, they either decided to, to go by part of it and not by some of it or to reject it entirely. And he knows that before he gets to the other problems in Corinthians, before he gets, if he'd have just wrote him a letter saying, flee from idolatry, flee from sexual immorality, they probably have misinterpreted that one too. He already did this once. We know, if you were with me in uh, Romans class, we know uh, the demonstration of how the dark power of sin, how, how strong it is. How it corrupts even God's good law. God's law is good. But through sin, it was corrupted. Know that Paul left a good church. It wasn't something Paul, that there was a weakness in the church. That Paul personally set it up. There's not, a, there's not talking about a problem with doctrine when, when uh, Peter came or a problem with doctrine when Apollos came. Never mentions anything like that. And he's not shy about saying it. He, when he has a problem with somebody's doctrine, he comes out and says it. It's not about unsound doctrine. This is about their own sin. And their inability to put it down. What a message that is for us. What things do we bring into the church? What things that do we, are we not able to walk away from in our own lives that that shade the gospel? And we don't allow the, the we don't allow God to disrupt our lives with the good news of His Son. That He came and He died for us, and that He saved us, and He rose again the third day. That to them was fascinating, but eh, maybe not the revival part, right? Even to those in Athens, they were fascinated with this. They thought it was another God called um, resurrection. They completely misunderstood. It. 
So now reaching all the way back around to 2 Thessalonians, where we started. The church there was under pressure from a community that thought the doctrine was just flat wrong. That decided that the gospel was wrong and it had to be stopped. The church in Corinth was under pressure from a community that thought all religions were bad. But this one wasn't any particularly special. But they didn't have to really change to, to come to this God, this other, this Jesus. They just needed to, this was just something else that they would do on Sunday. They would just come and listen. That was it. Corinthians 1.18. use it in, uh, as we grow with you, as we let the gospel of Jesus Christ work in our lives. Let it change us. Let our minds be transformed away from who we were to who we are in. We thank you for that work in your son Jesus Christ on power. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.